welcome everyone to our West Shore worship community. Safety and prudence require us to stay apart physically, but nothing can prevent us from coming close together spiritually. I'm Reverend Anthony McCarr, senior minister here at West Shore. Joining us is Dave Blazer, music director and acting director of religious education, Megan Ross. Megan has a few words for you this morning. Good morning. I am so glad to be here with you all today on this gorgeous day. I have a few RE updates to share with you. Today at 1130, we will be having Children's Chapel on Zoom. We'll be reading the story of Wangari Mathai, Wangari's Trees of Peace, and um, doing an art project afterwards. The link and all the information for the art project was sent out to all RE families via email. If you didn't get that email, please contact me and I'll be happy to share it with you. At 1130 also today, we have youth group with Kelly Pincus. Um, this coming Thursday, uh, member Jerry Davis has decided to continue his art classes for middle and high school youth. This class, uh, the class this week is going to be pop-up art, so I'll be sending a link, link out for that and also a list of supplies. And starting next Sunday, we will be having a brand new Pokemon group at 2.30. I'll be sending information out about that, so all you Pokemon players, get your cards ready, and we'll be hanging out next Sunday. Thanks so much. Pokemon, I want to get into that. <laughs> Today we are pleased to invite you into the space which is connecting people all over Cleveland and beyond to our welcoming community. Last week we gathered up data on this and we have viewers tuning in from 22 states and the countries of Spain and Canada. Love gathers us here today and it is an inclusive love that welcomes you no matter what your gender identity happens to be, your sexual orientation, your income, your race, your abilities, your particular spiritual leanings, and so on. You are welcome here. I have one announcement for you this morning. It comes from Board President Joe Schaefer. It regards election results. Joe writes, I am pleased to announce that Brian Gardner, Gary Nemes, and Liz Nolan have been elected to serve as trustees of our board, and that Dier Cody, Kathleen Heck, and Kelly Pincus have been elected to serve as members of the nominating committee. My thanks to this year's nominating committee for identifying these outstanding candidates, and my thanks and congratulations to all six for their willingness to serve West Shore in these important roles. In accordance with our new bylaws adopted by the congregation a little over a year ago, those elected to the nominating committee will take office immediately. Those elected to the board of trustees will take office at the beginning of the church's next fiscal year on July 1st. Thank you, Joe, for sharing this election news with us all. Once again, Welcome to this new day. Say this with me wherever you happen to be, one line at a time, our lighting of the chalice words. This is our chalice. This is our chalice. In many separate rooms, In many separate rooms. We, light we light one flame. Flame of courage. Flame of, courage. Flame of wisdom. Flame of, hope. Flame of hope. Together in spirit, we are one. Now let us greet each other, and we do this in both times of joy and times of sorrow. In our West Shore Weekly E-News, 
we regularly read about things going on with some folks in the section entitled, Among the West Shore Family. And in our greeting time from now on, I wish to lift the names of these folks up. It's the simple pleasure of in the face-to-face -face greeting time that I am increasingly missing these days, seeing a face, saying a name, giving and receiving a smile and a kind word or two. So we are lifting up names here. We are saying them out loud. Among the West Shore family. Last week we experienced the beautiful music of guest musician, violinist Mary Beth Ions, courtesy of West Shore member Kathy Kosorek. This is Kathy's attempt to pay it forward because independent musicians have not been covered by the stimulus package. Mary Beth appeared at the service to celebrate Andy's 83rd birthday and the Kosorek's 58th wedding anniversary. Happy birthday, Andy, and happy wedding anniversary, Andy and Kathy. And we're sending continuing healing thoughts and prayers to Steve Smith and his family, several of whom are impacted by COVID-19. We are sending them our love. Let each of us now say the names of people whom we are holding in our personal thoughts and prayers this morning perhaps people in our West Shore community, perhaps people beyond. Wherever you happen to be, say into the space of your room these names. You may even type the name into our West Shore Facebook chat if you like, if you want to share those names with folks who are also watching this live stream. I will pause for a moment as we say our names. Through this morning's greeting, we are extending kindness to others, and let us not forget to greet ourselves with kindness as well. As spiritual teacher Jack Kornfeld says, if your compassion does not include yourself, it is incomplete. And so I invite you to consider putting hand to heart to feel comfort in that simple gesture. Let us greet ourselves with kindness and compassion in this new day. Today, tomorrow, and beyond, let our hands be outstretched in kindness and let us keep showing up to our lives with an open heart, no matter what. So may it be. And now let us sing our hymn for the day, Blessed Spirit of My Life, number 86. offering this morning come from West Shore member Jerry Devis. He writes, throughout the course of world history, the arts have had an important impact on society during times of war, 
famine, social upheaval, and distress. Think of the graphic drawings of German expressionist Kathy Kollwitz. As an important 20th century artist, she shared in her work the pain and anguish she experienced with the loss of her son in World War I and the loss of her grandson in World War II. Here at West Shore, we have had a strong relationship with the arts. Music, poetry, literature, and aesthetic experiences are interwoven into the service and the ministry. Since 2005, we have had the Aesthetics and Permanent Collection Committee. Prior to this committee, there were previous fine arts groups, including an annual spring program called April Arts, Arts Fairs, participation in university circles, parade the circle, along with many others during our 70 plus years as a congregation. The permanent collection consists of pieces donated, special gifts, or purchased by the congregation. This collection is installed throughout the building uh, in the rotunda showcases, in the library, in the leadership and RE galleries. The works in the collection are by prominent and strong, diverse group of artists. Some are by members of the church, and many are by artists well beyond the walls of this community. This extensive archive of work is comprised of nearly 100 paintings, prints, drawings, photographs, sculpture, and artifacts, including many from our sister church in Romania. These pieces displayed throughout the building allow the congregation, staff, and guests to equally transform and allow the viewer to respond and connect in some manner. The Aesthetics and Permanent Collection Committee is comprised of more than 10 creative and dedicated church members. They have been responsible for exhibiting and maintaining the permanent collection, spearheading aesthetic decisions in the sanctuary and throughout the church, and also planning, installing, and hosting the six to seven different art exhibits throughout the year displayed in the fireside room and the rotunda showcase. These exhibits have brought a diverse range of art styles, themes, and approaches to the church and community. Artists from the congregation, works from members' private collections, artists from the community and beyond have had the opportunity to share their art in various exhibits. The committee has strived to reach and connect with other church groups and committees by coordinating unique ideas, images, and artistic voices together. From exhibitions about human trafficking, unhoused individuals in the community, LGBTQ artists, Green Sanctuary, RE, and the Child Care Center. Along with our UU history, our seven principles, West Shore's legacy, and a tribute to our ministers, there have been unique shows that have broken boundaries, such as an exhibit by Hispano, Hispanic, Latino, and Latina community, uh, an exhibit without actual art, but viewed by way of smartphones and QR codes, and also independent films. Then there's the popular live art summer series in the rotunda that have brought the Mona Lisa, the Kiss, the Scream, and Andy Warhol's Marilyn, and many, many more famous pieces to life. The vitality and uniqueness of the arts can bring people together even when there are different points of view, providing an opportunity to share, discuss, and make more tolerant of various perspectives around them. Art can be a very special place, providing solutions to the most difficult challenges that face the world today. And that is the word from Jerry Devis, and I am grateful for his leadership and for all those who join him in enlivening our community with the arts. Above all, I am grateful for people's financial gifts, which enable us to have a community at all, which gathers our gifts and talents and organizes them for positive impact and positive action. Currently, we are 68% of the way to our annual pledge drive goal of $550,000. That's a 4% bump up from last week. Thank you for that. I'd love to report that we doubled the bump up for next week. 
If you've not yet had a chance, please consider pledging. When I think about the pledge I have made, I reflect on how good it's made me feel. You know, I spend a part of my money to take care of myself, but I want to be sure that another part of my money is being put in service to loving kindness. It feels good to know that I am part of the reason why West Shore is able to impact so many lives so positively, especially in these times. I've also come to understand that a pledge to West Shore is a very different sort of thing from a donation to NPR or perhaps to a politician's political campaign or a similar kind of gift. Pledges to West Shore are the main source of income for the church since everyone counts and everyone counts immensely. West Shore's ability to change lives is currently made possible only through 309 pledges. But nonprofits like NPR and political campaigns can rely on thousands or even hundreds of thousands of gifts to support their good work. So in that sense, please know that your pledge is very important, not very comparable to a gift to NPR or to a political campaign. Your pledge is proportionally way more impactful. Every increased or new pledge significantly amps up the good that we can do. And you get to directly witness the changes in the world that come from your gift. To make your pledge, you don't have to wait until we gather face to face again. You can do it online, go to our website to find out more. And now please consider texting a gift to West Shore. Instructions about that can be found on, your, on our website and also on the screen. Thank you for considering a gift this morning. It is only because of your generosity that we can do what we can do. And this includes the beautiful music we are now going to hear, Claire de Lune by Claude Debussy. It is the third and most famous movement of Sweet Bergamasque, its name comes from Verlaine's poem, Claire de Lune, the title of which means moonlight in French.
Today's reading is a letter from the great American novelist Sherwood Anderson, Ohio-born, and he's writing to his son, John. John received this letter in Paris where he was studying painting. Father and son often wrote to each other about painting and art. Here's the letter. Ripchen Farms, Grant, Virginia, 1927. Dear John, something I should have said in my letter yesterday in relation to painting, don't be carried off your feet by anything because it is modern, the latest thing. Go to the Louvre often and spend a good deal of time before the, the Delacroix and, and the, the Rembrandts. Learn to draw. Try to make your hand so unconsciously adept that it will put down what you feel without you ever having to think about your hands. Then you can think about the thing before you. Draw things that have some meaning to you. An apple, what does it mean? The object drawn does not matter so much. It is what you feel about it, what it means to you. A masterpiece could be made out of a dish of turnips. Draw, draw hundreds of drawings. Try to remain humble. Smartness kills everything. The object of art is not to make saleable pictures. It is to save yourself. Any clearness I have in my own life is due to my feeling for words. The fools who write articles about me think that one morning I suddenly decided to write and began to produce masterpieces. There is no special trick about writing or painting either. I wrote constantly for 15 years before I produced anything with any solidity to it. For days, weeks, and months now, I can't do it. You saw me in Paris this winter. I was in a dead blank time. You have to live through such times all your life. The thing, of course, is to make yourself alive. Most people remain all their lives in a stupor. The point of being an artist is that you may live such things as you suggested in your letter the other day. I said, don't do what you would be ashamed to tell me about. I was wrong. You can't depend on me. Don't do what you would be ashamed of before a sheet of white paper or a canvas. The materials, they have to take the place of God. About color, be careful. Go to nature all you can. Instead of paint shops, other people's palettes, look at the sides of buildings in every light. Learn to observe little things, a red apple lying against a gray cloth. Trees, trees against hills, everything. I know little enough. It seems to me that if I wanted to learn about color, I would try always to make the separation. There is a plowed field here before me. Below it is a meadow, half decayed corn stalks in the meadow making yellow lines, stumps, sometimes like looking into an ink bottle, sometimes almost blue. The same in nature is a composition. You look at it thinking, what made up that color? I have walked over a piece of ground after seeing it from a distance, trying to see what made the color. I saw light makes so much of a difference. You won't arrive. It is an endless search. I write as though you were a man. Well, you must know my heart is set on you. It isn't your success I want. There is a possibility of your having a decent attitude toward people and work. That alone may make a man out of you. Love, death. And with these words from Sherwood Anderson, let us now move into a time 
of meditation and prayer. Take a deep breath in and breathe out fully. Inhale and exhale. Wherever we happen to be, whatever our circumstances, let the tensions drain away. Let them drain away. Close your eyes if you wish and just follow my voice. Let this moment be a moment of peace and beauty. Let this moment be a moment of aliveness. Let this moment be a moment of wise silence. Painting is easy when you do not know how, said the immortal impressionist Edgar Degas. But when you do know how, it is very difficult. Lucky for me that I did not know how, because a spring was breaking out in my heart. These are words from an Antonio Machado poem, and he says, Oh, water, are you coming to me? Water of a new life that I have never drunk. This was what I was feeling at 23 years of age, feeling a turning point in my life. I was about to graduate from college and start a new career. I was in a serious relationship with someone I eventually married and shared life with for many years. And I was gulping philosophical and psychological and spiritual wisdom like my life depended on it. Among the things I was reading at the time was a book by Strephon Kaplan Williams on Jungian Sonoy dreamwork. And so dreams were flooding my world every night. And he- here's one of them. An elephant is trapped in a glass bottle, and it is my elephant. I need to let him out. I do. And all of a sudden, the elephant transforms into a bar of soap. And I soap up my body with my elephant. And all of a sudden, I feel power coursing through me. I find that I can skate with the best of the Olympians, figure skate with the best of the Olympians out there. I can even do a quadruple Lutz. A spring was breaking out of my heart. Mysterious dreams announcing this fact, water of a new life coming to me. So again, lucky for me that I did not know how to paint. I avoided being like the caterpillar who can't walk because he's thinking too hard about the technique involved in moving all his little legs all at once. The priority was giving my emotional overflow form and using paint freely to do so. Other forms of visual art like sculpture or printmaking, photography or film, they all appeared to require machines and other complicated instruments. And again, I I had no patience with that. I just wanted to go from heart to brush to canvas. Direct flight, no stopovers, And this is perhaps the very first piece I ever did. I just went for it. 
paint on the canvas, following instinct and intuition. No attempt whatsoever to try to represent anything external to me. Red, white, blue, green, black, allowing whatever was meant to emerge, to emerge. Stopping when the result seemed to take on a life of its own, and you could see form and movement in the colors and shadows different people even seeing different things, and that was great. What I saw in this particular piece was something like a water buffalo, and he is in a strange landscape, lumbering away from what seems like water towards the viewer, and his head, unwreathed with horns, is bloody but unbowed. What did it mean? I don't know but it felt satisfying to paint. There happened to be a university-wide painting contest at the time, and I said, why not? And I submitted the painting. I ended up with second place, so maybe others saw something interesting in that too. Then there was this painting. While creating this one, I was listening to music from the rock band U2 their album entitled Joshua Tree. The volume was cranked up to 11, or it would have been if stereo manufacturers at the time had paid attention to the movie Spinal Tap. The music filled me with with so much. Songs like Where the Streets Have No Name, Running to Stand Still, and I Still Haven't Found What I Am Looking For. The music magnified what I was feeling in my heart. And at that time, I was a a two-pack-a-day smoker. And so one hand worked that paintbrush while the other, or from the other, a cigarette dangled. But then there was a moment where it felt like something clicked. And I put down that paintbrush and I scooped up a couple of of cigarette butts out of the ashtray and I took these smelly butts and I dabbed them with with the paint that I that and, and I used these butts to spread that paint and the paint ended up being all mixed up with tobacco leaf leaf and and ash the whole process felt true because it was gritty and messy this was happening this whole improvisational experience, which was unexpected and intense, while sounds from U2 washed over me, their cries of I still haven't found what I'm looking for. The year was 1990, and George H.W. Bush had just become president, and the Gulf War had begun. And I remember the angst and the horror of that time the passionate despair and longing of the U2 album which spoke to me, to us in that time. And when I was done with the painting, I looked at that image that had surfaced and I realized that what I was looking at was something inside me. Turbulence, yes, but three resilient, live, growing trees swaying gracefully. I had that in me. I don't usually give my paintings titles. I'm grateful for those of you out there who do. But this particular painting, it titled itself, The Three Graces. And it reassures me. Grace inside me. A green forest inside. No matter what the external world is like with its war, and nowadays with its coronavirus, As a German proverb says, art holds fast when all else is lost. I was personally realizing the truth of this proverb when I was 23, a messy yet transformative turning point in my life. Secret images of my soul disclosed through swirling colors on a page which I had introduced by paintbrush or fingers, or even cigarette butts. More paint here, less paint there, until it felt intuitively right to stop. And an image had arrived in all its fullness and complexity. An image had come home. It was 
another form of sleep and dreams, water of a new life coming to me. Since then, my track record with painting has been inconsistent. Around 15 years ago, I took a formal painting class, and that is when I learned the truth directly of Degas' statement that when you know how to paint, that is when it is very difficult. Soon after finishing the class, I gave painting up. No more painting for years. It's only been in the past two years, another transformative turning point in my life, and you are part of that. And now I've started painting again, and doing so by aggressively ignoring perfectionistic technique and just allowing the paint to do its own thing on the canvas without me imposing expectations, just, just staying curious about what is trying to happen through me. Stay curious every moment the mystery unfolds. This is a prayer. I, I wrote this prayer. This is a prayer I pray constantly, and this is definitely a pray prayer I pray when I paint. So when in the course of my general reading, I discovered a letter by writer Sherwood Anderson to his son, an aspiring painter, which he wrote in 1927, it made me happy. I felt a congenial creative spirit in these words which we all heard a moment ago. The object drawn doesn't matter so much. It's what you feel about it, what it means to you. A masterpiece could be made out of a dish of turnips. Draw, draw hundreds of paintings. This is as much true of the visual arts as it is of other forms, music, theater, dance, and other performing arts, or, or poetry and literature, and whatever else kind of art there is. Try to remain humble. Smartness kills everything. The object of art is to not make saleable pictures. It is to save yourself. If you have read about all the various plagues of history, as I have been reading, there is at the very least one lesson to be learned. Art is immortal, and so is the impulse to create it. It is a way of saying and saving what is best in humanity. It is a pathway into the sacred. I will, in fact, say that in art is salvation. And by this, I mean that art helps to deliver us from bad or difficult situations. Art is about resilience. Art is about strength to face harm and to come through with dignity intact. Salvation, in this sense, sustains hopefulness. Salvation, in this sense, keeps us fluid and flowing no matter what life brings our way. Each of us has an elephant trapped in a glass bottle. Not just me. Art can release it. Art with all the power that it represents. What art offers, says the great novelist John Updike, is space, a certain breathing room for the spirit, so put away the smartness which kills everything. Let the big voice of ego, which huffs and puffs and dominates everything, soften. And allow the little voices at the margins to finally be heard. Experiment. Play. The artist, said Picasso, is a receptacle for the emotions that come from all over the place. From the sky. From the earth. From a scrap of paper from a passing shape, from a spider's web. Lao Tzu in the Tao Te Ching says it this way, the Tao is like an empty bowl which in being used can never be filled up. Fathomless, it seems to be the origin of things. Whatever metaphor you prefer, space, receptacle, empty bowl, the creative act puts you in sync with the sacred origin of all things. You yourself get
get to be a sacred origin which, in being used, can never be filled up. That is an inherently spiritual feeling, at oneness with the Tao. And once you assume that position of humility, that openness, what you begin to discover through the artistic process are the deep roots of yourself, the enduring themes of your being, the objects of your most intense struggle and care, your ultimate concern. It happens in art that is more personal and abstract, like mine, and, and it definitely happens in art that is more public and activist with an opinion and a point that wants to be clearly heard. Think with me about one powerful example of this, the AIDS quilt. The Names Project AIDS Memorial Quilt is activist art at its finest, meant to remember and celebrate the lives of people who died from another pandemic that has visited our world. It weighs an estimated 54 tons. It is the largest piece of community folk art in the world. Here's how it came about. Go back to the early 1980s, to that awful time when HIV slash AIDS, that epidemic, was beginning. And the Reagan administration dismissed the seriousness of it, sort of like what we unfortunately have seen from the current presidential administration, its initial dismissal of the coronavirus. It's, it's unbelievable. But the Reagan administration's dismissal was even more foul because Reagan folks cracked jokes about AIDS. They joked about AIDS. There's a transcript of a press conference from 1982 hosted by Reagan's press secretary, Larry Speaks, and they reveal this. Journalist Lester Kinsolver, does the president have any reaction to the announcement by the Centers of Disease Control in Atlanta that AIDS is now an epidemic in over 600 cases? Larry speaks. AIDS? I haven't gotten anything on that. Lester Kinsolver, over a third of them have died. It's a pretty serious thing. One in every three people that get this have died. And I wonder if the president was aware of this. Larry speaks. I don't have AIDS. Do you have AIDS? And the transcript shows that by this time, the entire press pool is laughing. Everyone's laughing. It's a joke. This is just the tip of the iceberg. It makes me so mad, it's hard to speak. HIV AIDS deaths would go on to skyrocket around the world, and we know that all too well. So many dimensions to this tragedy. One specifically was how people dying of AIDS-related causes often did not receive funerals due to the social stigma felt by surviving family members, and also due to the outright refusal by many funeral homes and cemeteries to handle the deceased's remains. This is when this is when art stepped in. In a time when the President of the United States did not care about his people dying, in a time when his staffers were cracking jokes, in a time when HIV and AIDS deaths around the world both skyrocketed but were also stigmatized and went without public memorials and celebrations of life, in that time, art stepped in. Wikipedia helps me to tell this part of the story. The idea for the Names Project Memorial Quilt was conceived on November 27, 1985 by AIDS activist Cleve Jonas during the annual candlelight march in remembrance of the 1978 assassinations of San Francisco supervisor Harvey Milk and Mayor George Moscone. For the march, Jones had people write the names of loved ones that were lost to AIDS-related causes on signs 
and these signs were taped to the side of the old San Francisco Federal Building. All the signs taped to the building looked like an enormous patchwork quilt to Jonas, and he was inspired. So think again back to those metaphors of the creative act we discussed a moment ago. Opening up a space, being a receptacle, being like an empty bowl. AIDS activist Cleve Jonas looked at the signs taped to the federal building and a creative idea came and he held it. He received it. He gave birth to it. It, it was and is so powerful. Each panel of the quilt is three feet by six feet, and this is approximately the size of an average grave. In light of the fact that memorial services and grave sites weren't going to happen, the quilt became the way, the single way, for survivors to remember and celebrate their loved ones' lives. It also served as an open rebuke to a government that had failed its people it served as inspiration for building organizations and networks that would do greater justice to the lives and needs of LGBTQ plus people. It served as a goad to landmark social reforms that were long overdue. It is the German proverb again, art holds fast when all else is lost. Art helps to tell the story like nothing else, and it, it, it doesn't let you forget. It makes you remember, and because of that, things happen. And, and what about the activist art of our day now? What, what is the story it is telling? Perhaps the story here is how normal America works for some people, but not all how the coronavirus pandemic has made even more obvious the racial and social inequalities of this country. Our pre-corona existence, writes Brene Brown, was not normal other than we normalized greed and inequity and exhaustion and depletion and extraction and disconnection and confusion, rage, Hoarding, hate, lack. We should not long to return, she says. But now take a look at this next piece. This is Dr. Li Wenliang, the doctor censured by the Chinese government for trying to warn colleagues about the outbreak, who, and he eventually died of COVID 19. It's art that reminds us of the old, old story of cover-ups and propaganda coming from entrenched power when plagues come upon us. But old, old stories can change. New stories can happen. When Antonio Machado writes in his poem, oh, water, are you coming to me? Water of a new life that I have never drunk. This is not necessarily water of a life that is purely private. It can be water of our collective life. It can be a water that overwhelms entrenched complacency and systems of unfair power and floods them out, washes them away, leads to national and even global transformation as things are falling apart around us, says Brene Brown. We are being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment one that fits all of humanity and nature. You and I, we're going to work to help make this happen. I swear to God. We're going to do this together in ways that we are uniquely capable of in the time that we have to share. This is something I am promising you, and I want you to promise it to me. I need to close. And I will do it with one more of my own personal paintings, not activist necessarily, but suggestive. This is one of the last paintings I did at 23 years of age, at that messy and potent turning point in my life. And I have loved it ever since, 
like all my paintings, it started with simple curiosity about what would happen if I put a blob of paint there and then spread it. What would feel good to do? Go straight or curve it? What textures? What colors? Just making a space for play. Just letting that dream elephant out. Just being the empty bowl of the Tao. And what came up was a scene with lilting curves all against a backdrop of translucent blue in the foreground, in a way reminiscent of that other painting of mine we saw earlier, The Three Graces. Here are three figures in white, and they look like they are in graceful motion, swaying, dancing. The spring was breaking out in my heart, and it never ever wanted me to forget this, that I and that, and that we are stronger and more resilient than we know. This is our soul's truth. Life beats down and crushes the soul, and art reminds you that you have one. Amen. And now let's sing our closing hymn, number 299, Make Channels for the Streams of Love. Bring your chalice close to extinguish it as I extinguish the chalice here. We extinguish our flames, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us until we meet again. I wish to remind folks about the sermon chats that have restarted. We're going to meet today at 1 o'clock and then again on Thursday at 2 o'clock. So I hope to meet you there on Zoom. And let me also say that from now on, I think it's just going to be wonderful and important to be able to share birthdays and to share anniversaries and special things that are happening in the life of our community. So please let the office know or let me know if you're having a birthday uh, or something's happening in your life that you want the congregation to know about. I want to lift up your name in this worship service starting today and, and, and beyond. And now our benediction. It's Sherwood Anderson again speaking to his son. You saw me in Paris this winter. I was in a dead blank time. You have to live through such times all your life. The thing, of course, is to make yourself alive. Most people remain all their lives in a stupor. The point of being an artist is that you may live. May you live, West Shore, despite this dead blank time. May you live. May you live. So may it be. See you next week, West Shore. Until then, love and courage and cheer to all.